turn to the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to spend a little bit of time in Isaiah this Christmas season as a church. This chapter is a a delightful prophecy of the coming of Jesus Christ. And so since we're in Daniel as a series with our church, we thought to remain in the Old Testament, but to focus on a, a verse that very explicitly and directly talks about the coming of Jesus, would be in keeping with what we've been studying in Daniel in general. So we're going to look at kind of the overview of this first half of the chapter this week, and then we're going to zero in on the conclusion of this passage during our service on Saturday. You'll you'll see why. There's just really a lot here to get done in one sermon. So we're going to have two different sermons in effect on this passage one of the most well-known passages in the Old Testament predicting the coming of Jesus Christ. Let's, let's read this together, beginning in verse 1, and then we'll go through the end of verse 7. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt, contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it, And to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Recently I was putting Christmas lights up outside of our house. And my second son was helping me. And uh, he's for some reason gets songs stuck in his head. And then he'll just sing them. Uh, for days, weeks, months, uh, and this Christmas, apparently, it's the You'd Better Watch Out chorus, uh, and he just was singing along outside as he's helping me put up Christmas lights, and for some reason, you know how this happens to you as parents, your kids sing a song, and, and the lyrics strike you differently. Uh, in this case, as I was working, I, I just was noticing these lyrics, and something particular was, was striking me about them. I know it's a cute melody, but the lyrics themselves... Um, It could be sort of depressing, actually. Uh, You'd better watch out. You'd better not cry. You'd better not pout. I'm telling you why Santa Claus is coming to town. I thought, man, if you you read those differently, uh, it it really could be a fearsome song. So I practiced it with my kids to see how they would react. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why Santa Claus is coming to town. He sees you when you're sleeping. (laughs) He knows when you're awake. Imagine a dad writing this song after a wakeful child gets up for the 14th time. He knows (laughs) when you're awake. (laughs) He knows when you've been bad or good. So be good, for goodness sake. I thought, you know, even if Santa was real, Don't we have better news? Don't we have better news than that song? 
there is someone who sees you when you're bad, when you're good, someone who knows when you're awake, when you're asleep. And his message is not, you better be good. It's better news. Isaiah chapter 9 is a publication of better news. It's a song, you might say. There's a bit of a, a poem in the midst of it, but it's, it's a better song. It's a much better song. It's a song about God's grace, God's goodness to people who don't deserve it, that while he's watched them awake and asleep, they have not earned any goodness, nothing but coal and darkness is what they deserve, but the fact is, instead of darkness, God's going to bring them light. Instead of judgment, God's going to bring them mercy. Instead of conflict and warfare and hopelessness, God's going to give them peace. We have a lot better news than the Santa Claus expectation. This song, this publication, we, we could split, you notice there in your Bibles, it, it's split into maybe six paragraphs, six paragraphs throughout this first seven verses. We're going to divide those into two groups of three, okay? Two groups of three. First, the effects of grace, and then the actions of grace. The effects of grace, and then the actions of grace. Because in the opening paragraphs, Isaiah describes what is going to take place for these people. Isaiah wrote about 700 years before the coming of Jesus, he anticipated the exile when God's people were punished for their sins and they were sent away from God, as it were, away from God's temple. And in spite of a number of passages in his, his book talking about how this judgment is right and just in light of their sinfulness, he inserts these passages that anticipate a future time when God will show mercy to the undeserving. And this is one of those passages there's darkness and gloom in light of the exile, in light of God's judgment. And you can read the, the chapter 8 talks about the invasion of God using the Assyrian army to come in and invade and, and pass judgment on his people. But then he breaks in to a future anticipation where the judgment will not be the final word, as though, is what he's saying. And he begins by saying, here's what the effect of my action is going to be. And he talks about three different things. First of all, the effect is going to be that glory is going to replace contempt. You notice that in verse 1. There will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. He's personifying the nation when he says her. And in the former time, he says he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. Those would have, these nations would have been some of the earliest places of conquering when, when Assyria came in. He brought into contempt the land, but, but in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. So what's the effect of his grace going to be? Well, where you were in contempt and shame and gloom, instead, there's going to be glory. Glory will replace shame, you might say. Glory will replace contempt. So he, he talks about, here's, here's what the effect of my action is going to be. The effect is going to be from shame and contempt and gloom. You're now going to have glory. Great glory will be seen in the way by the sea. Jordan, the Galilee of the nations, he says. First effect of grace. Second effect of grace is that hope will replace hopelessness. Hope will replace hopelessness. He uses this metaphor of walking in darkness and then abruptly and suddenly seeing a great light. The people, it says, who walked in darkness have seen a great light. They dwelt in a land of deep darkness, but on them light shined. You can imagine in this day before electric lights and when oil was precious and scarce, what image this, you could think of the watchman of the night who are staring into the, the inky blackness of the night, and they're just waiting. And he pictures this people as, as living, as it were, in an endless night, a night with no end. It reminded me of one of my favorite books, which is by C.S. Lewis, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and, and he describes the land under the enchantress that is always winter and never Christmas. And I thought that's a little bit like what he's describing here, the people who have rebelled against God, they're, they're, they're always in the night. 
They live in the night. And I thought that's, that's how he thinks, that's how God thinks of people that are outside of his presence, that run from him. It's, it's like their, their life is a perpetual night. It's a gloom. They're stumbling around, never sure if they're safe, never sure what's in front of them, never sure what lies ahead, never confident of their next step. They live in darkness, vulnerable to any enemy. And he says, but not anymore. A light has come. Imagine that moment, if you could, staring into the darkness like you have for year after year, like a person staring into the darkness, watchman of the night, hour after hour, and then suddenly the first sign of the dawn breaks forward. Light, hope, safety, security. Where there was confusion, now there's certainty. Where there was anguish, now there's confidence, hope. In the face of hopelessness. That's the effect that God's grace is going to have. Those who had no hope are now going to have hope. The third effect of grace is joy in place of anguish. You notice he he called the nation people who were in anguish in verse 1. Then look at verse 3. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. You want to notice here these two key metaphors. So when the, when the harvest comes, that's, that's a sense of assurance, of provision for the future. They're going to have what they need for the winter months. And when they divide the spoil, that means that the enemy has been conquered and we're just reaping the benefits of that victory. But here... This takes place without any activity on their part. They rejoice simply because God has done an action and the effects of that action are like when they gather the harvest, are like when they achieve a victory, but instead of them doing it, God just gives them that same joy now. See, The effects of grace are going to be a glory that's going to replace a shame. There's going to be a hope that's going to replace a hopelessness. There's going to be a joy that replaces an anguish. The the greatest kind of joy that people could imagine. That's what God promises. So what kind of song, Christmas song, does Isaiah recommend we sing? Guess what's going to happen? Watch out. Watch for it. Glory. It's going to replace shame. Hope. Hope. It's going to replace hopelessness and joy. It's going to replace anguish. Sounds pretty good. That's the good news. That's the the joy that God promises his people. There's a grace that's going to come to them without any activity on their part. You notice this word comes to those who are in exile because of their sin, who are living in the darkness because they've chosen to reject God. This is not to the well-meaning. This is not to those who have, have proven a track record of, of godliness and, and justice and righteousness. No, it, it comes to those who have been thrust out of God's land. And yet his grace proves to be stronger and deeper And they could have imagined these effects are overwhelming, perhaps seemingly impossible in light of where they were facing exile. How will God do all of this? How will God bring about in the hearts and lives of his people this kind of glory and hope and joy? And and we might ask the same question. I I was thinking about this passage and I, I thought about, you know, in many ways this same experience is reproduced both in those who don't know Jesus and in those who forget what Jesus has done and they get caught up in in everyday life as though Jesus had never come. So let's identify with these people. Where maybe are you aware primarily of contempt and shame? Maybe the shame and guilt of your sin. Maybe the the hopelessness that comes of, of living in a place of confusion. You don't know what the future will hold. I thought about parents wondering that for the future with their children. What, what is the future going to hold? I feel sometimes like I'm, I'm living in darkness. It's confusing. I stare into the future, and I, I, I can't see anything. Or maybe you, you worry about, well, what, what, what's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen to my heart in, in light of some of the, the sins that I keep committing and these, this sense of, of, of guilt and conviction that is continually present? I, I, I peer into the future and I'm uncertain. I, I feel more gloomy than joyful. So how will God turn me into this kind of hopeful, glorious, joyful person? 
Is this just a, a, a magical promise that, that is just God trying to be nice and kind? Or is there something practical? Is God actually going to accomplish this? Is this just a Christmas card? I wish you well. Or will God do something to bring it about? Well, that's the next section of this song. The next section is the action of grace. God is not just a well-wisher. God doesn't just wish you well. He accomplishes what he promises. So the effects of grace are glory, hope, joy. But here's how he's going to bring it about. Here's how he's going to do it. And that begins in verse 4. There's three effects. And they build in such a way that the final effect is really the foundation and the means of the first two. So this song kind of builds into a climactic moment where the final effect is the ultimate foundation of everything God has done, both the actions and the effects. So the, here's the first two effects of, or actions rather of grace. First two actions of grace are the end of oppression. God will take action to remove the oppression of his people. For, he says, for, you want to notice in this passage, three uses of that word for. For in verse 4, 4 in verse 5, 4 in verse 6. You see that? So here's what the effect is going to be, and here's the actions. Here's why those effects are going to take place. Here's why. Practical, real plans on God's part, not just well-wishing. Practical plans. Here's what God's going to do. Here's why you can be, feel glory and hope and joy. Why? Well, first, the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Midian was the, the army that conquered Israel when Gideon was alive. If you remember, Gideon was that weak, scared Israelite soldier hiding in the cave. And the angel came to him and said, God's going to use you, contrary to every military expectation, God's going to use you to achieve victory over this horde of Midianite soldiers. And that's exactly what happened. So he says, look, that's going to happen again. There's this irresistible horde of conquerors and, and on you that they're like a, a rod of an oppressor to break your back. They're, 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 they're a yoke that, that you think of the image of a, an ox who's yoked and bound to hard labor. He says that's, that's what your neck has been like, bowed down under the tyranny of an oppressor. That's what it's been like for you. But now God's going to break that yoke. God's going to take off his staff from your shoulder. He's not going to lead you like a sheep. No, he's going he's to be broken. And the rod that he uses to crush and break you, God's going to break it like he broke those soldiers with Gideon. Oppression. No longer. God will set you free. That's why you can have joy and hope and glory. Because you're no longer under the rod of oppression. First action of grace is, is God delivering his people from bondage, from oppression. The second action of grace is that God brings an end to conflict. Perhaps even more surprising. He's not just going to break it at once. He's going to terminate conflict permanently. Notice there in verse 5. Every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. This picture is a, a soldier's boots tramping. And you could think of the metaphor here also of them crushing down God's people and God's people having to fight back against these oppressors. A garment rolled in the blood of a battlefield. That's an image that came to my mind as I was reading this. Just, just the, the blood's everywhere because of the slaughter and the violence and the danger. And, and even their clothing is just rolled up. There's just this sense of, of just annihilation that's taking place and violence. And God says, look, there, there's no more need for those things. Actually, they're, they're going to be so useless. And, and, and even just a reminder of them is so pointless. They're just going to be used as fuel for the fire. Just toss them onto the bonfire. No need for a warrior's boots anymore. And why would we want this garment rolled in blood? We, we don't need that. Toss it into the fire. It's just fuel. The end of conflict. Think about that for an, an Israelite who's seen conflict his whole life. Warfare, the danger of the Assyrian spears coming over the hillside and coming down, descending on God's people, and, and thinking back over the history of the Philistines that fought against them and the Midianites that fought against them. And they're just thinking, oh, can there be such a day when the 
boots of the warriors will just be tossed into the fire and the blood-stained garments wow, will just be a thing we're ready to forget. No more need for them. First two actions of God's grace is the conclusion of conflict and the conclusion of warfare. What good news this is. Now, how will God do those two things? How will those actions come about? Well, this final action of grace, you notice the four, four again, this culminating four, the four that's the basis or the means of all the other ones, is seen in verse 6. How will God do this? For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. He'll reign on David's throne He'll uphold it from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. What's the final gift of grace? The provision of a king. The provision of a king. A king. Now you can imagine in their understanding, this this would have been a descendant of David. Their expectation would have been that he's going to conquer militarily, that he's going to eradicate the kind of armies that have come against them. And you can imagine over the centuries, the Israelite people looking for this king. Perhaps, is it, is it somebody like Judas Maccabeus who fought against the Greeks? Maybe he's, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's somebody who's going to overthrow the Romans like the zealots sought to do in Jesus' time. Where is this person that's going to do all these amazing, incredible things? This would have been an expectation that it's going to be a a sort of a a human conquering ruler, a man with such power that he's going to establish an eternal kingdom. But if you read the song in that regard, you'd be missing the depth and the breadth of how this person is described. No human king could actually ever fulfill the kind of prediction that this king uh, receives. He's a child, so he's a, a real human being. He's a child. He's a son. But he's going to be called the mighty God. And he's going to have a kingdom that will last forever, that will never end. Now, we're going to get into next Saturday some of the details of the names that he's called here. I I wanted to save those for a whole message because it's just going to help us delight in who Jesus is. But here's the point we need to see. The, The New Testament picks up this prophecy, and it says there's only one person it could be applying to. There's only one person who could be a child who is also God. All of, all of the descendants of David, maybe some of them even sought to reestablish Jerusalem, and Zerubbabel sought to do that, and one of the prophets sought to build up God's people and defend against the armies. But, but he, kind of, he doesn't come close to accomplishing what's being described here. He, he, he doesn't even remotely fulfill this idea of a child who is also God. It seems like this impossible good news, good news beyond any expectation. A real human who is called by the very name of God, who eradicates conflict, that's the ultimate purpose of his mission, removes oppression and brings joy, hope, and glory to his people. In the New Testament, this verse is applied to Jesus Christ. Matthew 4, 12 through 17 says, Jesus, uh, now when he heard that John had been arrested, He withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory, listen, of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures, is the child Isaiah was talking about 700 years earlier. And it's not difficult to see if we believe fundamentally that God knows all of history. And if he doesn't, there's no hope for anybody because he can't see what's coming either. But if God knows all of history, then God can declare and bring about this fulfillment in Jesus of a prophecy that he gave Isaiah 700 years earlier. He says, look, I'm wanting to tell you that in the midst of your exile, in the midst of your gloom, in the midst of your darkness, there is someone coming. And the effect of his coming is going to be on imagination. Where you had shame before, you're going to have glory. Where you had hopelessness, you're going to have hope. Where you had anxiety and anguish, you're going to have joy. He's going to conclude conflict. Ultimately, he's going to eradicate warfare. He's going to eradicate oppression. Ultimately, that's what he's going to do. This is the fulfillment, the culmination of his mission. And in order to do this, you would imagine a person would have to be superhuman. Well, that's precisely who he is. He's a child who is mighty God. Charles Spurgeon says, The birth of Jesus is the grandest light of history. The sun in the heavens of all time. It is the pole star of human destiny. The hinge of chronology. The meeting place of the waters of the past and the future. What does this mean for us? It means that What Christmas is declaring to us, what Isaiah tells us, is that the coming of Jesus Christ is the greatest gift of God's grace that we can imagine, not because we've been good and kept an eye on ourselves, whether we're awake or or asleep, but because God chose to give his people this gracious gift. A son has been, what does it say? Given. Not earned. Not purchased. Given. A son has been given to you. A child who is God, given to you, able to accomplish all of these purposes. I don't have time to explain why this is the case, but we, we see very clearly in the New Testament that, that Jesus' mission is going to, in effect, accomplish this in two different stages. The first is going to be primarily spiritual, and then ultimately the effect will be physical as well. So there's a a down payment, a deposit of a spiritual fulfillment of these verses and then a final culmination of physical fulfillment. Here's what I mean. We, We see in the New Testament that Jesus eradicates the tyranny and oppression of sin and removes the cause of all conflict, the enmity between God and man. Right? We, we know that to be true. We look in passages like Romans 6 and many other passages where it talks about Jesus eradicates the tyranny of sin over his people. The ultimate oppressor, his rod is broken. And so Jesus says in Matthew 11, Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke on you, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So the the first fulfillment of this is spiritual. Jesus comes and he lives a perfect life and he dies on the cross and he takes the curse of his people on himself so that the guilt and shame of sin is buried with him in the grave. And for those who are united to him, it's their guilt and their shame that have been buried so that when he rises again, it is truly the case. There is no more tyranny of sin over those united to Jesus. So the child fulfills it. And for those who have hopelessness, because all they have to look forward to is God's judgment, he reverses it. He takes God's judgment and gives them instead the kind of joy people would have at the harvest. Because they have all they need for the future. Their provision is secured. Their oppressors defeated. And then we're given the promise that the spiritual fulfillment of this, which every Christian has right now, will be culminated in a physical fulfillment. So that when Jesus returns, it will truly be the case that warfare will be no more. That the lion will lay down with the lamb. That there will be no more any pain or death or suffering. That literally any instruments of warfare might as well be thrown into the fire. There's no need for them anymore. 
So we receive now the spiritual truth of this promise, and we look forward to the final and complete culmination of it. All because a son was given. What does this mean for us? I think a couple of things in application. First, it means let Jesus Christ bring us hope and joy in place of anguish and hopelessness. Jesus Christ and his coming should bring us hope and joy in the place of anguish and hopelessness. For some reason, this aspect of this truth this week really affected me when I thought about parents. So if you have children, um, if you have little children, I just want to encourage us, let's model the fact that Jesus is our hope in the place of any anxiety or anguish or hopelessness. I, I think we can model that this week as we just walk through a week in preparation for Christmas. We can help them to see, you know why we're, we're excited mostly for Christmas Day? Because it reminds us that we have hope and joy in Jesus. You know, you know one day the toys and the clothes, they're just going to fade. They're just going to tear apart and you might break them on the 26th. But in the end, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, he gives you joy and hope. and It, it never goes away. And, and you might experience pain and, and difficulty next year. Christmas doesn't guarantee that we're going to have a, a pain-free year. But Jesus is with us, and he gives us joy and peace because he is our Savior. I think parents can use this week strategically to help their children. And if you have, have grown children or, or teenage children, or, and, and maybe there's anxiety and a sense of, of fear and, and vulnerability when it relates to helping them, Let's remember, part of the good news of this is that there, there is someone who can accomplish this kind of transformation by grace where gloom and hopelessness and exile can be reversed. Now, we don't know when and how he's going to do that for each person, but we know that he can, and we can fix our gaze on him and his ability to bring that about. He's able to do that. He's able to accomplish these effects on even the most gloomy, anxious, hopeless, apparently exiled person. We know the one who's able to do that. Let Jesus Christ give you joy in the place of anguish and hopelessness. Second application, let Jesus Christ bring you or remind you of freedom from spiritual oppression. Now, his ultimate removal of physical oppression, we, we wait finally until heaven. But spiritual oppression has been broken because of his death on the cross. And so I was struck this week, I was thinking about uh, people, it could be men or women, who, who just feel the grip and the temptation of sin in their lives. Maybe a, a sin that has just been holding them for a long period of time, and it's very difficult to see the difference between a, a, an unbeliever who lives under the power of sin and your life that feels like it lives under the power of sin. Because it, it hasn't really changed very much. And maybe you're a young person and you, you struggle with anger at your mom and dad. Or maybe you've, you're a grown man and you, you've struggled with a particular difficulty for, for years, decades, and it just feels like it, it still ha, has, a, has a, a grip, a temptation on you. Now, is there good things we can do in self-control and accountability? Yes, but the ultimate foundation is remembering the truth that Jesus Christ broke the power of sin, which is our greatest oppressor. So that lust and selfishness and anger and pride ultimately, ultimately was broken in him. And we've been removed out of the tyranny of sin and into the, the mastery of Jesus Christ. And yes, it still calls to us, it pulls us, it tempts us. We might struggle, but we have to declare the truth. It is true that this child broke the power of sin. And in his name, we can grow and resist and fight and struggle by grace to resist that tyranny trying to get its hooks on us again. What's the Christmas season about? <laughs> A lot better than you better watch out. Don't you dare do that again. 
It's that, look up. Jesus Christ killed death and sin for you. And he offers you freedom in him and by the power of his spirit to continue to grow in godliness. That's, that's a lot better news. What does it say? Go to sleep at peace because Jesus Christ has covered you with his righteousness. Wake up in hope because he gives you the power of his spirit and he's broken the tyranny of sin. Good news. Remember what the good news of Christmas is. Final application. Let Jesus Christ give you the hope of permanent peace. Permanent peace. Not the absence of difficulty or temptation or uh, you know, conflict in, the, in a physical sense, but an internal peace that cannot be taken away. For the Christian who believes in this God child and what he did on the cross, there is a peace that passes beyond the realm of human understanding. It's not a peace that human logic could have come up with. If you just think this way and meditate in this perspective and just think this, it's not positive thinking peace. It's actual divine peace in which we can experience the kind of peace God lives in because he's God. And we can just enjoy the truth that our God is in control and he loves us. There's, there's that kind of peace available. The kind of peace where you're not even worried about conflict anymore because you have peace in your soul because of Jesus. I'm not saying Christians don't experience conflict with people and family and in society and so forth. But there, there is a peace because our king that was a child and died on a cross and rose from the grave is on the throne and we are united to him. And our sin or the sins of others towards us ultimately cannot take that away. And in the end, we have hope of a peace that will be permanent, the way it's described here, that there will be no more conflict, there will be no more warfare, there will be no more argumentation or annihilation. It'll, it'll be done with. Yeah, we're not fully there yet. We're looking forward to that day, but, but that's been given to us as a guaranteed promise in Jesus. So, if your husband and wife... And for some ridiculous reason, the conflicts increase when the Christmas season comes. Let's remember that we have peace in Jesus Christ. And that peace is not ultimately up to us. We can enjoy the peace we have in him. Or if you are around relatives and it doesn't seem very peaceful because they have opinions and political ideas and views about you and your children... There is a peace that Philippians says it's, it's like a castle, it's like a bastion. And we have the promise of that peace in Jesus. Might we suffer? Might we sin? Sure. But ultimately, our identity is found in Him, the one who removes conflict with God now and removes all peace permanently when He comes again. Removes all warfare permanently when He comes again. He's the Prince of Peace. These are worthy meditations this week, aren't they? This is what it means to be Christians at Christmas. This is what it means. To be Christians at Christmas means to declare to ourselves, and you've got to do that this week. So you've got a week to think about these things when you wake up in the morning and before you go to sleep at night. The child, the king, has come. He's already established and won the victory of all these promises. And the future fulfillment of them is certain and guaranteed. And we can enjoy that good news all week long. Remind, this, is, this is what Christmas is about. It's the gift of God's grace. And not to slip into a kind of Santa Claus religion that says you better watch out and don't you cry or pout because you know what's going to happen if you do that. No, we say, look up. Because we have a Savior who has accomplished our salvation and has brought us into his realm of peace and who has guaranteed our spirit that he will watch and guard over us and shepherd us until the end. That's a lot better news, isn't it? Let's think about that news this week because every Christian and non-Christian is tempted to slip into this idea. You better watch out and watch where you act and don't pout too much and cry and try to be nice to everybody and don't be naughty too much. We don't have Santa Claus. We have a Savior. 
much better. Gracious, loving, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, the prince of peace. The zeal of the Lord of hosts has accomplished salvation through the sending of his son for the good of his people. Let's think about that all week long. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we rejoice in the season where we celebrate your coming. We rejoice that you came. We rejoice, Lord, that Emmanuel, God with us, has come. And Lord, we just enjoy the promises of your coming. The promises that we enjoy now by the Spirit and by faith, and ultimately you, you'll bring to full culmination when you return again, Lord. Let us just fill our hearts and our family conversations and our friend conversations with just reminding each other about the good news of your coming and all that it means for us. Fill our conversation this week, Lord, and our, our joy this week and our expectation. Lord, let this bolster us against any, any temptations of doubt and anguish and hopelessness this week. You've come, and that's all the hope and joy and peace that we need. We thank you, Lord. We rejoice in you. In Jesus' name, amen.